The angle I'm going to take here today is I'm going to um, give you a kind of anthropological perspective on how we can capitalise on the changes that are taking place and thereby increase our personal and enterprise uh, strategic and economic uh, relevance. Now, if I go back a little bit in time, 12,000 years ago, uh, we were hunter-gatherers. Now, in physical terms and in mental terms, that's the present, more or less, from an anthropological perspective. So that's kind of how we're wired, in effect. And back then, we were very, very mobile. We had to be mobile in order to pursue lunch. We had to be social because we had to pursue lunch as a group. And if we didn't collaborate properly, uh, we might be eaten by lunch. So we were highly mobile, we were highly social. If we hadn't eaten for several days and lunch appeared on the horizon at one minute past six, we wouldn't say, buggery, I'll leave it till nine o'clock tomorrow. <laughs> Work and life were highly integrated. And we made our decisions in real time because if we didn't make decisions because of the, the real world, uh, we could end up dying. And we were highly creative in how we went about our activities. And the other main thing was that um, we were judged on our productivity. If we didn't arrive home with, with an animal or berries, uh, we were in trouble, so to speak. So we were judged by our outputs, so to speak. And that continued to, in the same vein, more or less, during the agricultural era. We were slightly less mobile, uh, but we still had to go to Mart with the cattle, and we still had to walk around the farm and so on. So for all intents and purposes, during the agricultural era, we were social, mobile. Um, our work and lives were very integrated. We were judged on our outputs. We were creative, and we made our decisions on the basis of what was actually happening. Then 200 years ago, we saw the arrival of the industrial era. At that point in time, uh, we stopped being mobile. We now had to turn up to this place called the, the factory. So mobility stopped. We were now employed as labor. We weren't craftspeople, we weren't artisans, we were labor. So we were paid on an hourly basis. And for that economic reason, we would try and do as little as we possibly could for a given period of time, because we're going to get this paid the same amount anyway. So you might say we invented laziness in the industrial era, and in turn, the owners uh, invented this thing called management. So management's, management was there to stop people being lazy. And of course, talking to other people and being social, or sociable, um, was out of the question. So we stopped being mobile, we stopped being sociable, we were no longer judged on our um, productivity, we were technology placeholders in the machine, basically. We were, we were labor. And we were not encouraged to make our own decisions because the process was very well documented and we didn't want the workers deviating from that process. So decision making and um, creativity were very much taken out of our hands. And because we generally didn't like work, we would look forward to the evening or we would look forward to the end of our lives because, you know, essentially, well, we didn't enjoy what we did for the bulk of the day. So we invented the concept of work-life balance during the industrial era. So we tried to keep these two things apart. Um, so that's an industrial era, industrial era concept. Now, what's happened of late is we started to see mobile push its way into the organization. The IT departments kept mobile out of the enterprise for quite some time. But the BlackBerry tsunami changed that. So mobile is in the workplace. And LinkedIn, social, uh, Facebook, you know, was out of the question a few years ago. Now it's there. And if you don't have it and if you don't allow your people access to it, you won't get people to work for you. So you might say nature's vines are pushing their way through the corporate car park. And what the digital economy is, is not the industrial era on tech steroids. It's fundamentally man's return to his true nature. We want to be mobile. We want to be social. We want to make our own decisions. We want to be creative. We don't want to have work-life balance. We want to have work-life integrated. Because if I'm Picasso, I enjoy painting at whatever time suits me, not on a nine-to-five factory basis. And we want to be judged, as Malcolm Gladwell and Daniel Pink are often saying, on our outputs. And the work needs to be stimulating, and there needs to be some sort of uh, commensurate relationship between our outputs and our rewards. So for me, the digital economy is much more than just, again, uh, better, faster technology. It's, a, it's an economic step change, and at the same time, it's an anthropological step change. 
I believe we're going from what you might say Neanderthal man, Homo sapiens, to what you might call Homo extensis, or augmented man. The internet has become the internet of things, and as portables become wearables, as wearables become embeddables, the internet of things becomes the internet of things in people. So we are becoming truly augmented. And this augmented person, and it's us, uh, is going to be demanding greater services, whether they are customers, users, consumers, or citizens. So the game is being raised. We're expecting the game to be raised, and people are expecting us to provide services to support that raised game. So let's have a look at this, uh, the implications in terms of the enterprise, so to speak. Cost management, we're going to have to keep doing that because what's happening is, as we speak, there are entrepreneurs in the back streets of Calcutta developing business models that will work in a povertized economy. And once they get that sub-$1,000 house, sub-$1,000 car working, they will bring it west. And in the past, you might sneer and say, oh, I've got an Aston Martin, I don't want one of those. But actually, it's becoming quite cool. There's a frugal capitalism thing evolving. And those guys are going to be eating the lunch of the developed nations. In many respects, if we don't get this right, uh, it will be kind of the last days of the Roman Empire for the developed economies, so to speak. So we are not going to be able to compete on cost. We're going to have to create uh, raving loyal fans, which means delivering very differentiated customer experiences. But at the same time, we're going to have to keep cost in mind. Agility is a big thing, and those of us, you know, I'm a former technologist myself. Uh, we're, we're all very aware of agility from a sort of IT uh, perspective, and um, Harvard Business Review, et cetera, et cetera, they started to embrace agility, so now agility is a business concept, agile businesses. Now, I might be getting a little bit semantic here, but agility is what happens when the lion is on top of you, so to speak. I want to be anticipatory. I want to see the lion coming, so to speak. And more important than that, I don't even want to be considering whether there's an actual lion, lion because that focuses me too much. I want to just have general attention of what's happening in the world. So whatever comes at me from whatever angle, um, I want to be ready for it. So you might say this is the arrival of the attention enterprise. So just constantly aware of what's going on, not overly focused on what's over there, anticipating, and certainly, hopefully, not fighting uh, with problems because they're hitting you uh, in real time. I'm being a bit semantic here, and the words are probably not right, but I hopefully you, you'll get my, my gist. Um, innovation, creativity, um, the Internet of Things creates great possibilities in this respect. You know, think of the dark assets that you have in your organization, like trolleys and hospital beds. If you stick some software into those, they become uh, very value adding. You know, at this point in time, when you go shopping in Tesco's or wherever, if you spent a lot of money, you get treated worse than people that spent very little. You spent very little, go through the express checkout. You spent a lot, go and queue with the rest of them. That doesn't seem like a very good model. Um, but if you build intelligence into the trolley, so to speak, then all of a sudden you can treat your best customers uh, like they are your best customers. So I think the Internet of Things in particular is going to change the game. So we need to be asking ourselves the questions, where can we get, where, where can we put sensors into our organization? We also have the concept of asymmetric business models. What are you giving away for free at this point in time? If you're not giving away anything for free, the chances are your brand is not spreading very well. So low-cost airlines such as Ryanair, etc., have lots and lots of people flying on their planes at below cost. And there's a few people on that flight subsidizing the rest of those people. Those people are called desperate. They're desperate to get to their destination and they're price insensitive. And that's how the model works. And because Ryanair can offer a lot of people very cheap travel, lots of people go for it and the word spreads and so on. Most of Google's customers get it for free, so to speak, but they still make lots and lots of money with a handful of people that do pay for its services. So ask yourself the question, how can you make your business model more asymmetric? Things that you value today and you charge a lot of money for, how can you give that away for free or, or, or nearly free? Um, in terms of the next generation of worker, who is now kind of the majority generation in the workplace, actually, 
you know, my, my parents and grandparents would have perhaps had one career in, with one employer. We're of a generation, perhaps, some of us who are one career, many employers. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of many careers, many employers stroke clients. So from an attracting uh, talent perspective, you've got to imagine these people are only going to stay with you a, a short period of time. You want to try and make them stay longer if they are genuine talent. Um, but somehow or other make money and, and um, provide value for both parties in the short time that you're together, so to speak. I see young people uh, more on a path to mastery than being focused on their economic requirements, as many of us would have been uh, years ago. So they realize they're going to be working longer into the day, longer into their life, so they want to do something they feel passionate about. They don't know what careers are awaiting them when they uh, come out of school and so on. And career paths like lawyers, architects and so on um, are going to become increasingly blue collarized. Blue collar work is becoming automated, white collar work is becoming blue collarized. So it's very, very different. The, the certainties that we took for granted in terms of careers, you jump on this conveyor belt, be a lawyer, you'll, you'll end up all right, doesn't exist anymore. So we're almost having to take, you might say, a lean startup approach to our careers. And I've, I've documented this in a, in a book I've written fairly recently. They're, of course, highly mobile and they're highly social. Any organization that tries to stop people being social um, is in trouble. But they also want to reserve the right to work in the middle of the night if it suits them. So we need to provide an environment that allows them to do great work when it suits them. And they're economically optimized. If you have uh, your outgoings more than your incomings, you have a problem. If you are subsidizing a lifestyle to impress people uh, you don't like with things you don't need or can't really afford, you've kind of got a problem. Um, so young people are looking at their parents and saying, look, I saw my parents climb the greasy pole. They've got all the toys, but they always seem constantly distracted, and they never had time to really enjoy them. That's not for me. So what they're saying is, I'm going to reduce my outgoings. And if I reduce my outgoings, I have more choices in terms of where I work, and so on. And instead of having the kind of state-of-the-art cars and so on, they will, they will use cars as a service. They will, go, they will go frugal, and they'll be frugal with pride, which kind of is a bit of a problem for the luxury goods industry. And, of course, they will get it right in terms of why they are working in the first place, which perhaps we've lost a little along the way, because the beauty of the industrial era, and I'm not saying the industrial era was bad by any means, it brought a lot of economic uh, good as we rushed from the villages into the cities and so on, but perhaps we thought, oh my goodness, there's all this money we can make, let's make as much as we can and forget about why we're doing it in the first place. So this individual um, is... Increasingly, the millennials, I think, are already the majority uh, group in the workplace and are likely to be that for about another 50 years, uh, so I'm told. And you might say, well, why are we pandering to these? You know, if you're a lawyer, you were abused when you joined the firm and you eventually got into a senior enough position to abuse the next generation. Now you're not allowed to do that. What's, this is unfair. Um, but that's how it's changing. It's changing. And the digital economy doesn't value experience, it values value. So that means that young people who happen to be very talented can become CEO of manpower or, or massive companies like that. The rules have changed. You don't just work your way up the stairs. So I, were, I, I, I spoke at an event fairly recently um, with Intel, and it was on business APIs. Now, most of us know what APIs are, application programming interfaces, and so on. And what I'm really saying here is that we should think about the APIs that we have in our organization. And if you don't have an API strategy, you don't have a business strategy, basically, in the digital economy. That's, that's an important fact. But I think these APIs should be geared towards what I've been talking about today. So... Building your services around being social, being mobile, integrated work and life, uh, the tools for people to be creative and to make decisions, you will then be aligned with nature, so to speak. You'll be providing services that people want. This is how many 
IT functions look like today. They are technology management houses or departments, and that's okay. Technology does need to be managed, and many of us have come up through the path where this is a natural thing for us to do. But of course, with the arrival of digital and so on, organizations are looking for a lot more than that. So I'm encouraging organizations to, to reduce their uh, tech focus, though it needs to be managed, but you can push a lot of that stuff into the cloud, and then start putting services in place, basically along the lines that, as I've just been uh, speaking. So, in terms of getting our IT department act together, so to speak, step one is to get our IT systems sorted out, our social systems sorted out, and as the Internet of Things co gets, comes online, to get that integrated. So we've got a holistic uh, model for managing these things. This will give us uh, insight. So this is what big data is all about. I don't like the term big data because it's, it's very inward-looking data management. It's not about data, of course. It's about insight. And once we've got our act there together, we now focus on the people. So the data goes into the computer. It comes out as information. The information goes into the person's head. It comes out as knowledge and wisdom. So we already heard this morning from the audience that collaboration is a very, very important part. In my view, the IT industry as we know it is, is dying. And when Nick Carr wrote that book, Does IT Matter, many years ago, I was personally offended. How dare he say that about our industry? But the reality is it's becoming very commoditized. And the ashes, or the phoenixes coming out of the ashes, are the information industry and the collaboration industry. And I think most of us are undercooking the collaboration part of that. And from wisdom, if you've empowered your users, your people, uh, with wisdom on a grand scale, then you can create uh, big customer experiences, differentiated customer experiences, and so on. Getting too excited about customer experiences without getting this fundamental stuff sorted out is just like, we've got an app, but behind it is a mess. So I would encourage you, obviously you've got to get results quickly, but I think, you know, this is my suggestion on the way forward. So your options are to be uh, disrupted or, or be a, a disruptor. Uh, Adam quite rightly put it out there that if you haven't got a game plan for this, uh, you're more likely to be disrupted. So let's have a look at how, in my experience, we go about making changes in terms of transforming, transforming the business. Step one is we need to transform the CIO, so they need to get it. Now, I think there's a lot of beating up of CIOs that, that's done in the press, and for a long time in the, I was part of that. Uh, but when people have been recruited to do a job, and now all of a sudden they've been told to do a different job, it's kind of not fair, so to speak. I got interviewed by McKinsey's about 20 years ago. Uh, I was a software developer at Logica, and I'd worked at the European Space Agency, so they thought, oh, his CV looks nice. They brought me in for an interview, and um, I had no clue what they were talking about because I was a software developer stroke project manager. They were giving me some business problem, and I just didn't get it. Just didn't get it. And I think there are CIOs out there today that still don't get business. They don't really understand what business is all about, because technology management in itself is very, very challenging. But we need a digital leader, not a, a, a chief IT manager officer. But once we get that right, then we can transform the IT function. There's lots of IT functions today that have been basically led into oblivion because they've been led by technology managers. That's a problem and it's not their fault. Then once you've done that, you go to the boardroom and we need to get, we, in most organizations we don't even have a digital leader or a CIO in the boardroom. We need to make every one of the board members digitally literate. For me, it's malgovernance and eventually analysts and investors will raise question marks about why, in the digital economy, nobody has a clue about this in the boardroom. Having done that, we then go about transforming the organization. And this is, this is, the, this is the tricky bit. Because in my experience, uh, in big established organizations, this change doesn't work. Because fundamentally, if you're, let's say, a, a major bank, you spent 200 years beating the creativity out of people. You're a process organization. Anybody who's found to be creative has a stern conversation with HR. And you can't just dip those people in a change management 
training course and expect them to come out as Lady Gaga. It just doesn't work like that. And what's worse, when you start impacting a model that kind of operationally works, though we don't know for how long, you start to mess up your actual revenue streams. So in my view, it just doesn't work. You simply have to create another version of your business, a 2.0 version of your business. So I'm not saying throw away 1.0, because that might run for another 60 years, six years, or six weeks. Somebody might bring out a 99 cent app tomorrow that just destroys your business. So you need to have this at least as an insurance policy. Hire creative people. So the Lady Gaga's, Andy Warhol, Salvador Dali types, they're the future. Because they, creativity is the only thing that's going to differentiate your organization from other organizations. And at this point in time, technology can't do that. So if you want to future-proof yourself, start to work on your creative juices. Build the 2.0 IT infrastructure, and of course you can build it from the web outwards. And from the 1.0 part of your business, well, make use of those services as well. Perhaps they can wrap them, so to speak, and sell them or serve them to the 2.0 business in a way that the 2.0 business can, can benefit from that existing investment. I'm not saying that everybody in the 1.0 business is, is, is dead as far as the digital economy is concerned. Some people might say, that's me. I want to be over there. And all of a sudden, they do their best work ever. But for a lot of people, they will look at the 2.0 business and say, what's that all about? I'm here to get a good pension. So I'm not interested in all that high-risk stuff. And yet, yeah, grow the 2.0 as a, as, a as a lean startup. And it's not, you don't do market research, you go into the market and you do stuff. And you either fail and step back, or you move forward, or in the jargon, you pivot and move in a slightly different direction. Anybody who has a business strategy, um, really in this day and age, it, it's a work of fiction. You simply have to move with the market in real time. So, disrupted, if you've got an industrial era factory model, uh, you've got a problem. So it's all about startups, but in terms of you know, if established organizations, let's call them start overs. They're starting over again, so to speak. Not an issue if you're a pure startup, but for many organizations, they won't necessarily have a future unless they, they take a, a radical step forward. So we've seen that there are step changes happening economically. We are seeing that there are step changes anthropologically. Organizations have the option uh, to be a disruptor or be disrupted. Individually, we need to make sure, as Adam says, that we have a disruption plan for ourselves. We have to wake up slightly paranoid. Let's call it healthy paranoia. Every morning, am I still relevant? Ooh, better get myself you know, on a training course or get different experience or whatever it is. Careers are not something that are managed at the start of your life with a little chat with your parents and the career officer. Managing your career is a real-time activity, basically if you want to stay economically relevant. So make nature your business partner, and then things will go well for you. Do not fight humanity. Do not fight nature. It is really the bottom line. The digital economy and digital society are built on digital services. And you are the guys that build these digital services. So the future of humanity is in your hands, so I'll hand the baton to you and the floor back to Adam.